Welcome inside the Brady Broadcasting Studios at 25 East Glen. This is the Jake Feinberg Show. Thank you so much for being part of the program today. Uh, pleasure's mine, Jake. Pleasure's mine. As the lizards lie underneath my porch on the back patio, I sit here sweating in 100-degree weather. I think about my guest and his perception of nature, his perception of art, and his perception of the human being. His perception of nature is one of beauty on inside and out. He is one to extend a hand and help fellow musicians when they are struggling to find unison in tempo and time. Work together because it's all in how you look at things. You could be peeling potatoes or playing the drums. Are you going to do something to your fullest no matter what the task? My guest does not fight nature. He maybe did it one time, made mistakes, figured out how deep the hole was, how to get out, and how did he get there in the first place. His perception of art helps him let go of control, sharing the stage, listening to George Duke, or Rick Fibaracci, or John Abercrombie. His taste in musicianship allows for touring for the last five decades. Appreciated more in Europe and Asia, but heck, jazz is a white term for black music. World fusion is now the goal of my guest. Get real people together for an extended period of time, work things out, and feel. Feel what it's like to contribute to a higher concept. Maybe you do it naturally, maybe with chemicals. That perception, that's his perception of the human. The human being is imperfect whether we allow ourselves to believe it or not. But the human existence is at the core of my guest's heart. Put your deepest focus forward in anything you do. Always challenge yourself by putting yourself in diverse situations and know you will not be loved by all for these reasons, but for different reasons. I am not a drummer, but I'm a journalist with an agenda to get out in front philosophically as it relates to wisdom, leadership, and longevity. Oh, and summer camps too, like the one my guest is hosting this summer for able-bodied men and women who will have the accessibility to musical masters. Billy Cobham, welcome back to the Jake Feinberg Show. Pleasure to be here, Jake. It's just it's great to have you back, man. And uh and and I wanted to I wanted to ask you to set the scene for the audience about this camp, uh, this 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 summer um I don't know what the, even the right word is, uh enlightenment camp uh and how you're going to go about what are your what are your expectations how is it going to look and uh, let's go through that a little bit well i we're coming to this environment that is uh it, it, it's like a retreat it's like going to a it's not a monastery actually it's a castle and it's owned by a family um and that they've been i've been blessed with the ideas that I mean, they're allowing me to to use about six or seven eight rooms of of, of the area plus their auditorium which is internal uh, to to present some ideas with with a, a group of associates of which there would be 25 bass players, 25 keyboard players, 25 guitarists, and 25 drummers, and with uh, the whole idea being using the Spectrum 40 band, which is um, myself and Dean Brown, Rick Ferrabracci bass, uh, Gary Husband keyboards. We discuss and uh, how. We play. We will play in our individual rooms. Uh, say we take a basic track and we'll work together with, with uh, key individuals whom we'll, we'll be assigning to play along with us for an hour, uh, each hour, and that, that will continue to change. And we will critique and, and discuss approaches to performance, uh, how we've gone about coming to where we are, how the, the development of our individual instruments has uh, reflected our concept in performance, how our past experiences uh, in performance have brought us to the point where we can share uh, our presentations now uh, in a secure fashion by saying, well, from what I've learned, if I play, for instance, uh, within the rhythm section that is never, I've never worked with before, I have to choose a very simple approach that I feel will be most effective, not only for myself, 
but what I feel will be for everyone else. Uh, it's like a, a round table of four individuals who don't know each other, who have not had any prior experience, but yet know that there are certain pieces, certain approaches to certain pieces that will work mm -hmm. because of their past experiences. So what, what I want my people, my colleagues to do, if it's in this way, is to put forth their best effort to introduce themselves to me through their instruments. This is what we'll be discussing, and this is what we'll be uh, providing examples of in, in terms of how to quickly hit the ground running uh, in, in playing in bands uh, that we've never worked with before and building a band base from that point forward. Can you, could you, uh, without letting the cat out of the bag, um, could you talk about an experience that you had working with people you maybe never worked with before? I think back to the story you told me about the, the Jack Johnson sessions was a 25 minute accident, but I'm also trying to say, okay, so what, what is, what was the, one of those times in your career where you got into the studio and said, I don't know any of these cats. All I could do, you know, speaking of the, 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 the actually Bitches Blue sessions or Jack Johnson, just, I knew everybody on the session. Or I, I knew who they were by reputation. I had an advantage. And that advantage was this guy who played trumpet who was just pointing to people. And his aura was that, was that strong that you kind of knew when to play and when not to play. What was very special about him was that I could add him to my my musical palette, if you will, and take direction from him in body language, and, so to speak, um, contribute where I felt it was necessary. It was what I don't know where I got this from with Miles, but um, <laughs> he's a very very special. He was, and I mean, even when I say is, because he's still present in me, um, and. And I believe in many other of my of my contemporaries, uh, where we would we would only play what we felt was necessary to make the music have a life. It wasn't about how many notes we played and how advanced we were or on our instruments individually. It was about what the personality of the of the of the music, the pic, the real picture that was put forward really meant um, and how that personality would be instilled in the minds of those who listen so that when you, when you left the, the studio or when that record came out, after a while people would know exactly all the lines. I mean, I remember with McLaughlin, sometimes we would sing the solos from, from different tunes that Miles had recorded with, with, with Herbie and Ron and, and Tony Williams, uh, uh, Wayne Shorter or George Coleman, uh, just, just because of, 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 of the, the actual depth uh, of the presentation. It's not just the, the solo, but also the, 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 the treatment that the rhythm section gave. Uh, it, you, those things were with us for life. They're still, I mean, they're here. I can, I can feel it. My Funny Valentine, um, uh, lots of different pieces. It, it, it's just that he had a way. And when I was in situations like that where I didn't play with, uh, well, I hadn't played with a lot of these musicians, I found the first thing I needed to do was just not play. Show, show restraint, not because I couldn't, but because I wanted to understand the direction in which the music was going. Mm -hmm. And these are things that you, you, you can talk about, and you can also play them. And this is, going, this is a beauty. This is a, a, a certain perspective only Billy Cobham can present. So I'm not afraid to talk about it, because I challenge anybody else to come up with my perspective. Um, it's nothing that I, uh, I have to hide. It is what it is, but I can only present that. So if people are interested in, in checking out where I'm coming from, this is where you can do it. You know, uh, 
Wow. God. You know, can you, so what about, uh, how did you, leave? I just found this track. I don't, I don't have it queued up, unfortunately, but it is a, it is a stone jazz track called Thunder Walk with George Benson. How, when did you run in, was Benson, like, did you know him or, or I'm still trying to get to this idea. So like you knew everybody in the Jack Johnson sessions or you were familiar with them, but when these, mm-hmm. with, with, with younger musicians, I assume musicians a lot of them are going to be younger that are coming here you know a lot of them uh like myself i mean they spend a lot of time in front of their computers or in their rooms doing solo work there's just you know they don't have that opportunity to play with other real human beings and um and and so i guess what aside from your philosophy and your tech the and the music how are you going to Knowing what they have to go back out and face in the in the world of music that we live in now, what what is the advice you're going to give them? Because it's very different. I mean, you were playing ping pong with your calendar back 40 years ago. You just wanted to stay busy, and you did because there were just so many opportunities. So what do you right. you know? I mean, it's sort of like you're giving them all these beautiful principles, like even mm-hmm. you know all this great stuff about humanity. I mean, McLaughlin just told me about. How he was selling caviar to hotels in England. I mean, this is about humble stuff, you know, and, and, you know, you know who you are now, but knowing that these cats are going to leave your castle and then go back to this world, what will you tell them that they can still hold on to when they go back out there? Uh, the idea of, of, of pacing oneself, uh, I'm trying to find a word, which I think, has a lot, which, which covers it all. Fundamentally, the word is patience, but patience in many different ways. It's not just holding back. It's knowing when to apply, uh, feeling confidence. So here's another word, confidence, secure, being secure in what you do. You have an approach that you want to present to the music that you feel that you are, you can contribute in a secure fashion what you feel from inside. And you, you the one person you can't lie to is yourself. Hmm. You, and if you're, if you're there at the camp to compete, then it'll come out in the music. But if you're there at the camp to contribute and to, to learn how to be a better contributor overall, to share your ideas with whomever may come across your path. That'll come out in the music too. And it'll come out in the way of playing less than playing more. You see, Mm -hmm. because the way we are, we have conversations. I mean, every language, it's the same. I, it's an amazing thing. When people really respect each other, they have a call and response concept. They listen, then they speak, because they understand what it's all about. When, when, when they are not respectful of anyone else, whether it be involuntarily or voluntarily, by, they don't tend to listen to what anyone says. They just speak over, and they just it's like breaker, breaker, breaker on, on the old CB radio. Mm-hmm. And so they end up, those same people have to go right back to square one, to hear what the original conversation was because all they have is their own uh, version of it based on what they say. And that can come from a lot of different reasons for them personally that they have to deal with. So it's kind of like being able to get players, musicians to, to play and, 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 and go, how are you? My name is. Um, <laughs> this is who I'm about. Oh, really? Your name is this? And it's coming through the notes, you see. Mm -hmm. And, oh, I didn't know you played bass like that. Oh, I didn't know you played, oh, really? Those chord changes? That's an interesting comment. And all of a sudden, but, you know, I I have something for that. And it's like, here's how we become friends. And that's what what it is about the music. You want to create an environment where everybody feels at home with each other and comfortable. Uh, in some way, it doesn't mean that they have to, this is, this is not about chill out or lay back. This is about making a group statement. And if you can do that, 
you work forever because there's not a lot of people doing that. Why, why do so you? When you th- yeah. Go ahead. No, why do you think uh, younger, myself included? I mean, just about uh, you talk about thrashing around, not listening sometimes um, mm-hmm. musically. Why? Are younger generations more apt to be to say, "Look at me, look at me, look"? Where has it gone? Because, like you said, uh, it's about sharing. It's about being an accompanist, knowing your role, and contributing. All those things are sort of values that require introspection. And so, I just wonder why. And you have kids. I mean, why? Why has younger generations where Where are we going to ride with that? How has the ego uh, become? How, how has the ego superseded the music itself? This is natural, man. This is, this is in every, every generation hmm. from the, uh, time immemorial. It's always been about me, 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 me. That you go back to the, to the days of incredible, incredible gentlemen, just from, from my perspective, the Buddy Richards and the Stan Levy's and the Mel Lewis's and blah, 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 blah. And it would go on and on and on and on. And there was always a battle. The Gretz drum night, Gretz drum battle, Max Roach battles Elvin Jones, Max Roach does this, <laughs> Buddy Rich does this, and it was like, okay, okay, so it's pitter-patter, 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 all right, uh, and then it's about the music, and quite honestly, I'd listened to a lot of these cats from the past, and I loved everything they did, but at the same time, I'm saying, boy, there, there's a sense of urgency to everybody, mm-hmm. because they were living in this time when they had to they had to really perform, and it was sports. It was, there was no computer. There was no this or that. So there was no chance for any chill-out music or anything like this. It was about put up or shut up, and it was like playing football on, on a team or what. So, you know, you're working all the time, and everybody's trying to keep their job. Things have changed, but still the concept is there. In rock and roll, it's all about... How many notes can I play? How loud can I play them? How can I look? It's just that kind of personality, and it's a human trait. And then there are a few people who take it to another level. A Kenny Arnold, very, very straight ahead, bang. Just like, but he can, he's very, very flamboyant. He can play, you know. A Bissonette, same thing. A Simon Phillips, same thing. Um, uh, Dennis Chambers, they know how to control what their, their musical environment and play musically at the drum set, not rhythmically alone. Uh, to play musically involves many different dimensions, not just rhythm, but selectivity in concept. Uh, when to play what on what drum, okay, what sound, what combination, where uh, to, to apply technique, intensity, Intensity cannot be mistaken for, for speed or volume. Sometimes the most intense things can be played at, at, at double pianissimo and sustained if, if the musician knows, at the drums, knows how to do it. So you, you have to learn and you have to play from your experiences and bring forth these ideas from your past experiences. Otherwise, it doesn't work, you know? And these are the things that... Are, are to be presented and shared uh, in an environment that I would like to, to have in in, uh, in in Czech Republic this this summer. Well, um, you know, part of your uh, mission this summer is also uh, working as a rhythm section, and uh, part of what I wanted to do was highlight all the different uh, rhythm players that uh, you know rhythm sections you've been with. So I just wanted to play a piece of music here, and we'll, we'll come back and get into it. Here's a little polka number for all your death and destruction freaks. <laughs> Around him, didn't have too much to say. No one dared to ask him business, no one dared to make him stay. Free to their mind, the guy on his head. The guy on his head. It was early in the morning when he rode to the town. He came riding from the south side, slowly looking all around. Running, can you hear the whisper from each lip? And he's here to do something. 
some biscuits with the big iron pots. Just started talking, made a plane to go. bring back some memories for you yeah <laughs> but i don't know who it is <laughs> that <laughs> really that is uh <laughs> that is a, a live performance of bobby and the midnights from june of 80 I, I was about to say that was whoa yeah it's Can't i'm gonna mail you this see it's the most explosive first of all someone from the audience recorded it and it just your drums and alfonso's bass are just pulsating. But what I love about it is this spontaneity on stage. You guys were all listening to each other. You could, it, it was a beautiful thing. It was, and, and to me, I'm like, there's Billy just playing a cowboy tune. You told me last time, right. you said, you said, you know, if your job is to play beer barrel polkas, you need to know how to play polkas. Otherwise you're going to get fired. Right. I mean, right. that, talk about that, that band, not so much how it came together, but as you got into it, it was a, a couple years evolution. You guys cut an album or two. But talk about, that was, a, you put yourself into a completely different scenario, but yet Al Johnson was playing bass. Talk about how you guys communicated as a band. Bobby Cochran was my catalyst. Bobby Cochran had, that, that was home, uh, that is home for Bobby Cochran. And where was like, was, where brought the, this personality that I've always just shook my head and go, man, what a special person! That <laughs> I I only wish that we could we could have found some administrative way to keep things together because I thought that band had had a, a very very special place in my heart. But you know, you couldn't have everything, and between Cochran and Alfonso. Um, uh, and 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 we, we had um, Brent, great great keyboard player, and they, they they sang, and it all it was from the heart. I mean, it was their kind of stuff, and I felt like I needed to learn that. I needed. I was a student, and and that's part of American uh, lore in a way, if you will, for back, uh, in, in, and it was an area that I just never got into, and I was always curious about this this country feel and, and, and I just wanted to, to, to do it as long as I could. And then I got, I got pulled away with them, some other stuff, but I, it was a lot to learn. And, and while I was working with them, man, I had a ball. No well, problem. you know, um, cause when I talked to Bobby Cochran, he said that, that, um, Weir was so flamboyant that you got, you and Al Johnson and, and, and uh, Bobby would go backstage after a set and just be in, in stitches cracking up because he was such a, perf yeah. can you, I mean, he was a unique guy and uh, I know that, that administratively, obviously there were different personalities in the group, but to me, it seemed like I just look at it. I mean, there's a great video from, I believe, Switzerland from 83. You probably maybe have seen oh, it. I brought them over. I brought them over and, and, uh, I, I remember Cochran was so nervous, you know, he was going, he wanted it to go so well. Now, that's one thing about Bobby Cochran. He was, he was definitely all in and 10,000% and, and more. He just wanted everything to be perfect, and it couldn't be because we just didn't have, the per, we didn't have the personnel to make it all perfect. But, uh, and, you know, just to have Bobby in the Midnights on a, on a stage in Lugano, uh, was a very big plus for me, man. And I, I mean, I, I, it was a big salute for me to have have that group, along with Herbie Hancock and and Gil Evans and Louis Belton and all that. It was all part part in, in, of the same project. And and I I'll it's one of the how can I say milestones in my life. Um, 
that I was able to be influential enough to get all of the people whom I highly, highly, highly respect and to come together to make a presentation like that. I, it was never to be done again. And uh, so I'm happy I just was able to, to get it done even halfway that way. Yeah, no, I think that one of your legacies, Billy, and uh, you got more to do, but when I look at the musical landscape, you have fused all the music. You've actually gone out. It's not just about, you know, where I can go out and interview guys from across all musical spectrums, which is cool. But what you did with music is you went across and played all those spectrums. And you went in and said, I gotta, I want to be a student. I want to learn this stuff. And you're taking guys from Mill Valley. And you're taking guys from the South and New York and from Lugano. And you're, and you just, it just, it was relentless. But the, I was curious, when did you first get into, um, uh, when did you first hear the reggae drum beat? Was it when you went to Jamaica uh, with Bobby and the Midnights in 82? Because um, that, that reggae beat really in the 70s was pretty hip because they were playing on different different uh, notes. Is that right? Yeah. Um, I I heard it with, um, remember Third World? A, a little. Remember that group? Yeah, but, but, but that seems like later. Okay, go ahead, continue. I think it was a... Because see, the Midnight's came. We went to to the uh, we went to this festival in Jamaica. That was just beyond. It was my a big experience for me. Uh, working, uh, going traveling with with uh, I was traveling on a flight with with I I'd have to honestly think that there was at least ninety percent deadheads on this one plane. <laughs> And we were going to uh, uh, we were going to Jamaica. You know what that means? Yeah, yeah, I want you to tell me the story. I really do. I I know what it means. Uh, it was yeah, cool. Uh, well, so it was uh, let's see, Goldie, Goldie, Goldie Rush, and it was just like the whole crew. Everybody came, um, and I. It was one of the most amazing times I've ever had watching everything go on. Uh, and when we got down there, just walking around in, in, in the grill and all, and we're getting ready to, to play, we were on, I guess, on the same night as the Grateful Dead, I think. I know. That I can um, tell you. I can help you out. The Dead, the Dead played, uh, the, uh, the Clash played, and then the Dead came on late, really early in the morning. The sun came up. Right. And you guys were going on noon that day. Oh, okay, okay. So, so what was beautiful was uh, somewhere in the middle. Wasn't Gladys Knight in, in the middle of that? Uh, absolutely. It was. Or it was. A, it was a smorgasbord of uh, maybe her. Yeah. Yeah, I'm not sure, but I know. I know. Um, Rita Marley was there. I, it was like all these people, and I just. I don't know. It just seemed so natural to feel this music. I'm. I am. I am. When I'm, I'm Panamanian, but I'm from the from the the, the black Panamanian community, mm -hmm. and that music is in the black Panamanian community. Uh, cannot go. I mean, you're going to have that. You're going to have calypso, uh, you know, along with everything else. So it's 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 just in my blood, you know. And so when I heard it, it was I was like I was on home, you know. And I really started. It, 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 that's what it made. If we would, we were trying a lot of different things that made me feel very comfortable, and I feel that I've been very blessed in that I've been able to cover a, a wide range of, of musical concepts based on family background, I guess. Mm -hmm. You know, mm -hmm. the whole Latin thing, the reggae thing. It, yeah, that's home. You know, the African. Yeah, and then straight ahead jet. Yeah, that's home. You know, I mean, you it's just. The way it's been, and that's that's what that's again what I want to present at the retreat. And that's that's what I wanted to say is that when I when I you know like with uh, with Alfonso he 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 had a lot of he made a lot of lists he needed everything to be very uh, you know on time where Bobby mm -hmm. was much more spontaneous and loose mm -hmm. and didn't have a schedule and it, it's it's spontaneity and you kind of my question is for this uh, for this retreat. Are you going to focus on spontaneity within the studio session, within that that opportunity to just create and not think about, not have it so so choreographed? Yes, sir. That's the whole. I mean, the objective is to speak 
you know, our conversations are are not pre pre designed. We may have questions, but then we 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 may stray away uh, into a sub level of things that just you know have been sparked by a point that was made, uh, and that's what it's all about. You know, that it, it, it's to talk about and to it, it, as provide examples of how we work together. Uh, what at what point do we? We we take an independent step away to to gather something to bring back to the table that may be at least as effective, if not more, than what was presented, and share it with everyone. And again, let's. I want last time I asked you this question. Talk about it from a nonverbal. How do you do that from a nonverbal point of view without talking too much? What you do is that you play. You play, you especially from a drummer standpoint. For me, it's about the, the the sound of the drums. What drum? What cymbal? How you are selected? What do you play to contribute to the table of the music foundation in real time? Only you, and this is where you become the painter, the artist. You know, in terms of visual terms. You, co- you contribute something, and it should trigger something in, in, in your rhythm section and your solos. So depending on what you do and depending on what they do, you guys, everybody gets locked into a loop. And now it's like, oh, you feel that way? Oh, no, yeah, really? Oh, I didn't know. <laughs> and, and that's coming through the sounds, through the frequencies. That's where it's all about. You know, I, 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 uh, I, I know that you... You know, you're, like you said, the your 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 Panamanian descent. Um, you know, you live in Europe now, and um, Johnny Johnny Griffin and Art Farmer and all mm-hmm. these cats. Uh, mm-hmm. I I wonder. I ask you this, and you don't live in the states either. And I say, why? What? What was it always about? The understanding. We're talking here a lot about values and philosophy and wisdom and you know i just say to myself man like i know billy comes to the states i know mclaughlin comes and does charity tours but Mm -hmm. when those cats left when those cats would go to europe were they doing it because um they were appreciated as as truly as artists or was it or is this country just does it not want to acknowledge its own art form i think it's 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 uh that uh, at the time, when you're talking about Johnny Griffin or mm-hmm. Art Farmer, they they put roots down because they were able to 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 be acknowledged at that time for what they did. They did not have to fight uh, for the space. It's a different period of time in 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 the uh, in the business where those guys are concerned. And and so Johnny had his roots down. I mean, I made his last record with him, mm-hmm. and uh, just a few years ago, and he. He came back to the States, but again, he, and he never forgot where he came from. It's just that he had more opportunities to, to make his presentation in a smaller region in, in, that, in, in essence, to some degree, you could put that region within the United States. And it would be, you know, it, it didn't spread it out. There. There's a lot of different countries that would become states, mm. some of them much, much, much smaller than, than, than uh, I mean, or equal to Delaware, anyway, you know, many of them. <laughs> right, uh, right. So, you know, looking at it from that standpoint, you cross a border. In the United States, you've got, you've got maybe, without, without any reflection on Johnny, growing up right now, you've got maybe potentially another 150 of them coming if they just knew what to do with it, what they learned, and, and the genius, the mentality. I think the U.S. is a, is a region of geniuses. There's so many people competing to do things and getting better and getting better and getting better and getting better. Some of them just go, why should I compete when there's another stage about 4,000 miles to the east that I could probably go and be a big fish in that little pond? and get more 
uh, mileage out of what I do without having to compete with a lot of people who would be potentially at my level. So a lot of guys like Kenny Clark and all, all these guys, they stayed. Families, people respected them more because they didn't have the competition. They were unique. They were very special. Then when they came back to the States, it's like, oh, Kenny came, Kluke came back, or, or Art Taylor came back. Everyone remembered him for what they did. But there was already about 10 or 15 generations of people doing it better. Right. You see, because that's right. just the way the U.S. is. Right. I also, <clears throat> but I, I can't ignore the fact, I mean, I talked to Larry Willis last week, and he's talking hey. about, you know, the man. And, uh, you know, he's just talking about, you can, I agree with you, there is all this incredible genius uh, here in the, as there is anywhere in the world, but we foster uh, geniuses and there's opportunities here that don't exist in other places. But he was just talking about the stifling of our culture, the stifling of our art form. And he used Harlem as an example because Sugar Ray Robinson used to live there and 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 the conga drums were out in the streets and things were, and there were clubs everywhere. And the point is that Everything was out, visible. The culture was out. And he's talking about our country now. And you don't live, I mean, take it from me, you don't live here right now. But you can feel that that clamping down of our culture. And what Larry said to me was, when you stifle the culture, when you stifle that, anything can happen. And, and, and I think that that probably the goal of my show is to just philosophically get out in front because, and make sure that people know, long after we're gone, how real music is made and 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 your retreat is is another part of that i just sort of it, it, it upsets me to say i wish it was going on somewhere here i'm sure that and i know there are great camps going on here but when you when i talk to to the to you guys it's so enlightening <clears throat> but yet all the creative stuff is happening it's not happening here and it really was an eye and larry talked about baltimore Baltimore, the North End Lounge, the Left Bank Jazz. Now he said the one traditional club with a jazz policy you have to get buzzed into. And I'm not trying to sound like some naive person. I'm just saying that's right. that's the situation that's going. That's the time we're living in. It's it's kind of it's a lot of depravity. It's a lot of I don't know. I mean, I I it, it just seems to me that that the opportunity for improvisational music for listening, most importantly, what are the values that we're trying to teach people to make to, in order to create great, good music? It's almost impossible now because when you look back at the time when you were doing Thunder Walk with Benson or mm-hmm. Horace Silver, I mean, mm-hmm. you know, the cost of living with the minimum wage, it was okay. But now it's like, mm-hmm. I don't want to get too global, but that's all I'm saying, you know, is that, is that you know, I, I, I start to wonder about the... the um, the ability for th- for regeneration and, and 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 the cyclical nature of music in this country specifically, you know, and and whether you have any desire at all to to even come back and ever and ever live here. Living, no. Um, one of the reasons is that I I lived in New York for, for for forty years, and at some point in time, it's important to give give away give way to others to, to have that experience. I'm, I'm kind of like, in a way, going to Europe, sort of semi-retired. Um, it's easier to function here. Um, it's, uh, and, and, you know, you have a bit more, more air to breathe and, and more time to decide which way you want to go, what you want to do. Um, New York, I would not be able to do that because there are a tremendous amount of distractions, uh, so many things to do, so, so much going on. It's wonderful, but you, you, your head is going left, right, left, right, up and down. All these different things that are quite equally uh, viable. So you end up like going, I can do, I can do, I can do, I can do. And by the time you figure out what you might want to do, it's the following day. You lost the day. <laughs> so, you know, you just go, okay. And that's just New York. I know. But I'll tell you what, um, I, I, I pushed for something, and we, we were lucky uh, with it, we went, and I think I may have spoken to you back in September. I don't know. Sure. We went to places like Taos, New Mexico, and Albuquerque, and I think we scared a lot of people. Why? I, I yeah, re- tell me why. I remember talking. 
<laughs> I was talking to Ron Carter, uh, and he's saying to me, and, and Kenny, we went to dinner at some point uh, before I started the tour, and we and uh, I was sitting with him and Kenny Barron, and they said, well, where are you going? And I said, well, you know, we've got, we're doing New Mexico. He said, really? <laughs> you know. And I said, yeah, man, we're doing New Mexico and Jim Thorpe and Pennsylvania. He said, where is that? <laughs> uh, um, Jim Thorpe, he, man, I love it. I said, it. yeah, and then we're going to, you know, I think it was like, uh, was it uh, Toledo and or someplace like this in, in, in Ohio? I said, really? Wow. Who's booking you? I, you know, and it's not about who's booking us as much as the idea that I was putting out that, yes, it would be nice just to play in the flyover states somewhere. Exactly, uh, man. Uh, you know, just to, just to open things up, you know, uh, just to, to, to come, because I know that the, the audiences are there, it, but the interesting part, Jake, that was, was amazing and when we played there, many times people came to me and said, why are you here? I said, just to play, play a game. Just, you know, I said, yeah, but people don't come here mm-hmm. to play. Uh, I said, well, you know, this is why we're coming. I said, we're so happy that you came. I said, you got to come again. I said, well, you know, nudge the promoter, whatever. I'm ready to go right now. I mean, I played Atlanta for the first time with my band in easily better than 20 years. I, I mean, it was like, what? I, as a matter of fact, the last time I played a, a really good, I mean, solid gig in Atlanta was maybe 1976 with George Duke. Well, I was even going to say, I remember looking back on the, on the, um, you, you guys in 84, granted the Midnights were kind of going apart at that point, but you played at this saloon down there. <laughs> and some, yeah, but it wasn't my band. No, that wasn't your band, right? You and do so. The question really is: when those people come up to you and they say, "Why are you here?" and you just say, "Why not? Why yeah. not? Why?" I mean, that to me, see, it's so progressive, and I, I because it's it's what you're saying is, you know, it, to me, it's you know, you look at the urban centers that were, it's very very smart on your part. The urban centers in this country, like New York, yeah, there's mm-hmm. still some clubs left. Uh, it's very fast paced in Seattle, you know, but the urban centers really in this country, Detroit is a great example. You know, they, mm-hmm. there, there's going to have to be a regeneration. They're not the places, but what you mentioned was Taos, Albuquerque. Mm-hmm. Next time you got to mm-hmm. put, we got to get Tucson on the board. These smaller oh, towns. Yeah. Ready small. Right now. Mm-hmm. Well, I, I'm going to, I'm going to work feverishly. No, what I'm saying is that, uh, the, these smaller towns seem to me the flyover states, whatever you want to call them, neglected. These are the places where these synapses. Once you start doing that, it comes back. And to me, that is sure. absolutely. I, I haven't heard anybody talk like. See, the the Ron Carter, Kenny Barron response is more is more is more true to. Uh, that's more common of what I hear. Why are you going? Well, who's booking you? I mean, it seems to me there are these places that are these vestiges. People are hanging on to these, these vestiges that of, 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 for, of time before. And you're saying, well, we got to open it up. I just love the fact that you're coming here. I mean, but you also, like Johnny Griffin, you could say, this is, even though it's not really your original ancestral home, th- there's a place of, there's a home in the States for Billy Cobham. And you're Absolutely. Co- and I feel that it's important as an artist to to give back. I mean, to come in there to invest in all. So I mean, it's not only there. I mean, I was I was just quite 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 honored to play the Dakota in in in, in Minneapolis to to get to to Chicago for the first time since 1976 77 with my or 78 with my own band. But we played the Park West. We played a we played at Evanston, and I hadn't played there with my band since. And so it was wonderful to get to Chicago. It was great. You know, I, 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 I can't say enough, man. And, uh, you know, so it's playing places like that, or, and even Portland, Oregon, uh, it's like, wow. Uh, it, it, yes, L.A. is fine, you know, and New York is, is I, I would never, you know, uh, short, uh, soft sell it in and short, short change New York. It's very important for me. But to finally get to places like that in, in Boston on some kind of consistent basis, I'm, I'm quite honored. One, and to know that we can play the sellout houses and, 
Uh, they, they may be small for, by, by some people, but for me, I, there was a long time that I, didn't, I couldn't get in there to even try and see if I could sell any tickets. <laughs> so I'm happy. <laughs> you know, I, one, one final question for you. Uh, I, I know what you mean, but I want you to explain. Um, how did you scare the audiences musically? How did I scare the audience? Well, you said you scared some of the audiences. You said you you said quite frankly we scared them. I mean uh, within the music, it, you said that about. Okay, okay, I, I see what you mean. Yeah. Well, it, it's just that they were not prepared. We played the Playhouse in Atlanta, right? And the first tune was a tune uh, by Spectre, uh, by by Rick Ferbacci called uh, "Sphere of Influence." The sound was very, very, very strong, very very powerful, not loud, very, very present and, and very, and very unified when we play it. And because no one's heard of Billy Cobham and anything like this uh, for, for so many years, I mean, generations, at least two generations have gone by and here we come, not hip hop, you know, Mm -hmm. with, with a presentation that's like, that's how it used to be. My dad said back in the day. And now I'm hearing it now. So that's what he meant. Mm. Yeah, that's scary. It's like a ghost. Mm. Can you imagine if, if Jan and, and Rick, you know, and, and, and Jerry were to actually do a turnaround and come together with John and myself? It would scare a lot of people if it were possible. It would uh, put a lot of people in shock because that was a whole other world, man. Well, um, any final thoughts uh, about this uh, that you want to talk about, about this, uh, this, this beautiful camp this summer, uh, how long it will be, when it will be, and, and uh, who it's open yeah. to? Well, the main thing about the, the Billy Cobham uh, uh, Art of the Rhythm Section Retreat, uh, for me, the horse, actually, is that I just want to share uh, my past experiences with a select few uh, a maximum of 100 people on four different instruments, and uh, to try to get get them to understand that it's uh, it's not rocket science. It's about feeling. It's about what what you do with with uh, when you speak and have a conversation. Uh, if you're willing to listen to your colleagues, uh, to know how to take their ideas and to to share them and and build on them. And if, if we can do that, a lot of people will come away. Not everybody, but if you're ready for it, I guarantee you'll be 50% better than when you walked in the door. Trust me. Um, and also, uh, how, do you, how should I proceed uh, to get you to come to Tucson? Who should I talk to? Um, you can talk to my wife. Fine. Fine. Can I should I just can I reach out? I reach out email wise because I'm I'm yeah. gonna I'm gonna yeah, start. Reach pl- out to us. It's a, it's, a, it's a guy. We have an agency in in, in the United States. Uh, Brad Stewart and those guys. Uh, but it'd be great to talk to us. And it, that it's ended up being uh, you know we're the mom and pop of this company. And uh, if we try to as we go along, we try to work with with all of our friends as much as possible. And we consider you one for sure. Hey man. I'm gonna. I'm already got my. I'm already thinking about. It. I'll reach out to you soon. And thank you so much, my okay. man, for doing this. Thank you very much. All right. And, have, uh, I really appreciate what you've done, Dave. Thank you very much. Thank you, Billy. Talk to you soon. Okay. Bye. Take care. All right. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Bye bye. Bye bye. This is the Jake Feinberg Show, and we'll see you all in a little bit.